Hello, and welcome to another episode of NASA Science Live. My name is Karen Fox, and I'm NASA's Senior Science Communications Officer and your host for today's episode. It's exciting to think about all we can learn from these two new missions to explore Venus. And later in the show, you will have the chance to hear from scientists about each of these new missions, ask them your questions, and learn why Venus is such a fascinating planet to study. But first, we have two special guests here to tell you more. Let's hear about this exciting announcement from NASA's new Administrator, Bill Nelson, and NASA Science Associate Administrator, Thomas Zerbuchen. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you on camera. Uh, our new Administrator, uh, Senator Bill Nelson, I'm just so glad to be working with you and uh, learning about your passion you have for all things space and also of space science. And we're here because of those two discovery missions focused on Venus. Indeed, I'm just honored to be here with such a notable scientist as yourself, Dr. Z. Uh, and we're proud to have you a part of the NASA family. Now, tell us a little bit about these two missions to Venus. So first of all, you just said they're missions to Venus. Now, be aware we have not been on Venus for over 30 years here at NASA. Wow. And so basically of all rocky planets that are in our neighborhood, it's the one planet we know the least about. So the two, planet, the two uh, missions called Veritas and Da Vinci Plus will map the surface of Venus at 100 times the resolution we know today and will analyze the atmosphere that has the whole history of the, that very thick atmosphere of Venus, really making the first such measurements ever. So as we move away from the sun, there's Mercury and then there's Venus with a very thick atmosphere. And the next one out is Earth with a habitable atmosphere. And then comes Mars with a very minimal atmosphere. So we're going to find out why Venus has such a thick atmosphere and why it traps all that heat like the greenhouse effect that it can even melt lead on the surface. Tell us about that. Uh, it's absolutely incredible and what's so puzzling about it is we think that if we looked at let's take Venus, Earth and Mars three billion years ago they would be roughly the same modest type atmosphere and, and as you said correctly the planet Venus went a really horrible track right kind of trapping this and frankly we don't know today why that is we know the greenhouse effect is a really important part and of course that's something we worry about tremendously at Earth as well enormously because we are heating up the more we put things like CO2 and methane up in the upper atmosphere it's going to trap that heat and we'll continue to see the effects of heating of the earth as we learn more about Venus how is it that we learn enough to be able to discover more solar systems and other galaxies with other planets that we call exoplanets. I love that. Uh, kind of when we made the selection, we were focused on that just the same way as you're indicating. We have over 6,000 planets that we've discovered, and so many of them are what we will call Venuses. So they're like a little bit like, you know, a rocky planets like the Earth, but they have very strong atmospheres, and frankly, we don't know our Venus, so how could we understand these other Venuses all over the galaxy around other stars? Well, I'm so excited about this. Uh, not only are we going to send humans back out into the cosmos, further out of low Earth orbit, but we're also going to be concentrating on science. And part of our science is that we're looking at planetary science to find out What's out there? Is there more life out there? This is an exciting time to be at NASA. Yeah, I'm so glad to be at NASA with you right now at this time, and I couldn't be more excited about all of these topics. With humans going away from Earth, frankly, we're opening up new ways of doing science as well. Uh, and, and so we're really excited about, we're cheering on the humans out of the science director, just like uh, our own robotic ambassadors that are going all over the solar system. 
Thank you, Dr. Z, and thank you for joining us today. As you've heard, there is so much we can learn by studying Venus, from insights into the evolution of planets to clues about planets outside our solar system. There's so much to gain. Let's take a deeper dive into this mysterious planet. Mysteries abound in our universe, but bit by bit, we are unlocking its secrets. We now know that our galaxy contains billions of other planets, but how can we learn more about them? What traits do these exoplanets have? What are they made of? What are their environments like? How have they evolved over time? Are they habitable? And can planets lose habitability over time? Imagine we could study one of these planets up close. We find one of similar size, mass, and composition as Earth. By all accounts, this planet appears very similar to our own. We discover evidence that this world may have once had liquid water oceans and volcanoes, a setting that could have been favorable to life. But over time, something drastic happened to this environment. This planet's sun grew brighter and hotter, increasing the temperature here to the point that the oceans boiled away. And then gradually, the volcanic gases created a thick atmosphere with clouds of sulfuric acid. That once friendly environment was gone. But all is not lost. The remnants of such a world may hold the key to understanding planetary evolution and habitability. The twist is that this isn't science fiction. This planet does exist. And if we want to learn more about the past, present, and possible future of our planet, and the billions of similar exoplanets out there, this mysterious one needs more study. And it doesn't reside in some distant solar system. Truth be told, it sits right next door. This planet is Venus. And the more mysteries we can unravel here, the more answers we can find out there. It's incredible. And now that we've learned a little bit about the destination, let's hear from two experts to tell us about these new missions. And remember, throughout the show, you can send in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA or commenting in the stream wherever you're watching us. We're now joined by two very exciting guests, uh, Dr. Jim Garvin, the principal investigator for the Da Vinci Plus mission, and Dr. Sue Smrankar, the physical the principal investigator for the Veritas mission. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. So first of all, congratulations on the big news. It must be so exciting to have your mission selected. Uh, can you both tell us how it feels to have gone to this point? Why don't we start with Dr. Garvin? Well, Karen, it's beyond enthralling. It's actually beyond words. Uh, for me personally and for our team on Da Vinci Plus, carrying the name of Leonardo to explore Venus, this mystery exoplanet next door. It's just mind boggling. We're going to go back in time to understand a world that's been a lost horizon. And by bringing ourselves there with the best of the technologies we have in our measurement systems, we're going to open up the Venus frontier for, for everyone. And the people of the planet Earth will go with us. So we're ready to go. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's absolutely exhilarating. Um, I I think it must be like what it means to, uh, you know, get on a rocket and be uh, strapped in and blast off uh, away from Earth's gravity. It's just been an incredible ride. We are uh, super excited, the entire team, in fact, you know, the entire Venus community. We, we, uh, we won the, the double lottery, Veritas, Da Vinci together. Uh, it's just amazingly exciting. We, we, so many of us have spent, uh, you know, decades, in fact, uh, working to this moment. So it's an incredible ride and we uh yeah we can't wait to uh get the keys and uh start revving up and uh building our spacecraft to take us to venus well congratulations so here we are we have just selected these two new missions to explore the mysteries of venus could you each explain the goals of veritas and da vinci plus uh, i'd like to know how they differ and in what areas will they work together we'll go to dr Strenkar first sure so you know, as you heard about in the uh, conversation with uh, Senator Nelson and Dr. Sabukin, 
uh, we really want to understand rocky planets. Um, what makes them habitable? What makes them tick? Uh, you know, both in our solar system and in other solar systems. Veritas and, and Da Vinci are really aimed at that. We want to, uh, on Veritas, get a global view of the surface of Venus. Uh, we'll be peeling back the clouds using special, special instruments to see through the clouds uh, and revealing the geologic history. Uh, we're looking for processes that are active today and uh, you know, really understanding how the interior of Venus from its core to its surface geology, uh, to the volcanoes that help create the atmosphere, how they all interact and help um, build a habitable planet in the past and where it went wrong to become this uh, supremely uninhabitable planet today. Oh, and, and I'll just say, you know, sorry, I, well, sorry for the interruption. I'm thrilled that, that Da Vinci is there with us because we really have great synergy. Um, you know, we'll get the global view and they get the close up. You know, this is just what the Mars missions have been doing for uh, decades now, having the global uh, orbital view and finding super exciting science targets and uh, then going down to the surface in detail. So, you know, it's just a, a great pairing of these two missions. Well, thanks, Sue. And, and Da Vinci Plus is like a flying rover chemistry lab that descends through the atmosphere from the cloud tops to the surface, making measurements by ingesting the atmosphere and measuring it. We're bringing sample return to Venus through our meter scale probe that will see the surface with human scale eyes in 3D and compositionally as we take the plunge. And our spacecraft will unravel the history of the key chemical constituents in the atmosphere, which are like the, the fingerprints of the processes that Sue was talking about locally. And that atmospheric record will tell us the history of past and perhaps lost oceans. We'll measure the cycles of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and sulfur and phosphorus, which all put together this massive atmosphere. Venus is telling us something because it has this big atmosphere. We're going to go there back to that lost horizon with our mission to connect those dots so we can see Venus up close, and as Sue said, and globally, so she can become the exoplanet next door that tells us how to discover exovenuses and how they work beyond our solar system. We literally cannot wait to get started working together with our partners at Veritas. This is going to be an epic ride, trust me. So let's talk more about this planet. Uh, Venus is not the closest planet to the sun, but it is the hottest in our solar system. Between the intense heat of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, the corrosive sulfuric clouds, and a crushing atmosphere that is 90 times denser than Earth's, landing a spacecraft here is incredibly challenging. Of the nine Soviet probes that have achieved the feat, none lasted longer than 127 minutes. So, Dr. Garvin, can you tell us how Da Vinci Plus will withstand these harsh conditions and plunge right down into Venus's atmosphere? Well, what we're going to do is make our instruments comfy. That's key. So the instruments won't feel that harsh atmosphere that you can see here, the sulfuric acid, the dense pressures, the supercritical fluids near the surface. We will encapsulate our instruments so we can make those telltale measurements hundreds of times while also imaging this exotic landscape that today may look very hostile and alien, something out of Star Wars or Star Trek, but in the past may have looked like this. An ocean world, perhaps an ocean world that started life like Earth for billions of years. We can read that record through the measurements we make by protecting our instruments to give us that wild ride. It will be a magical mystery tour as we make the measurements to put together the history book of Venus. Fantastic. Uh, now, Dr. Smartcar. I understand that Veritas will chart surface elevations over nearly the entire planet uh, to create three-dimensional reconstructions of topography and confirm whether processes like plate tectonics and volcanism are still active on Venus. So can you explain to us why it's important to understand these particular aspects of the planet? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, we're kind of uh, exploring the once and future Earth, in effect, by going to Venus. Uh, you know, as we've talked, Venus has this incredible greenhouse atmosphere today, but, um, you know, it was once much more habitable. And by actually uh, studying the processes that are, we believe, active on the surface today, uh, we can, in effect, go back to the very early start of uh, Earth's history. Uh, you know, uh, Earth probably looked a lot like this, as well as Venus in its early days. Uh, and the process that has been the dominant uh, factor controlling the Earth's surface and much of its atmosphere is plate tectonics. So on Earth, uh, plates move past each other 
and the process of subduction allows plates to sink into the mantle. Um, and we think that that, that step of, of one plate sinking into the mantle is the very first step in plate tectonics that has you know, set Earth down this path of becoming habitable and um, you know, developing continents, developing oceans. But what about Venus? We, we would think the same process would happen on Venus, uh, but it, so far it seems to have only given us subduction. So we can go back uh, effectively to the very uh, first billion or two years of Earth's history and understand that process of how does plate tectonics, this incredibly complex process, how did it start? What are the conditions that allow it to happen? And that's a, a really important question for being able to uh, you know, look at just the density, the size of exoplanets around other stars and say, you know, are they likely to be habitable? Should they, are they likely to be like Earth 2.0? All right, so why now? What has advanced in technology since we visited Venus in the 70s and the 80s? Now I'll start, start with Dr. Garvin this time. Well, everything. Technology, science results, modeling, what we've learned about our solar system, our universe, our planet, is, is just an amazing paradigm shift. And so what we thought we knew in the 70s and 80s has been transformed by Venus missions, Magellan, uh, the Venus Express, the Akasaki from Japan, but also by our capabilities. We have instruments now we can encapsulate to measure things a hundred times finer than we were able to measure in the 70s and 80s. And by bringing that powerful transformative knowledge, we can probe Venus' atmosphere, measure her surface in ways that were unimaginable 30, 40 years ago. And that's why we're going back. Venus is calling us. The questions the science community have now about past habitability, how does a planet lose habitability? I mean, I lose change, not habitability. We want to understand how Venus lost that, because that's part of our own destiny, perhaps. And reading Venus record book through chemistry, through landscapes, through global studies like Veritas will do, will change everything. And if we don't get to know our exoplanet next door, how will great new missions like the James Webb Space Telescope connect our solar system to the exoplanetary systems beyond? That's a key question. We can do that with the modern techniques of today. Da Vinci Plus and Veritas will both do that in the 21st century. I can't wait to go. Yeah, and uh, same, same holds for Veritas. Uh, we are building on the discoveries of past missions and the technologies developed uh, to study the Earth, to study uh, other planets. Um, we uh, have to look through the very dense clouds. You've been seeing these images of uh, Venus's cloud cover. Uh, we have to use uh, special tools to uh, peer through those clouds and we are uh, building on instruments designed for the Earth. We're uh, going to fly the first ever uh, um, instrument, uh, so-called spectrometer, that kind of look at the composition of the surface by peering through the clouds. So, uh, you know, from those instruments to the cloud cover, uh, we'll be able to get an entirely, entirely new look. And yeah, in this image, you're seeing uh, what the topography of Hawaii looks like. Um, this is what it looks like currently in the data we have from Magellan. It, you know, you can see that there are some high points there, but we're just going to be revealing exquisite detail. You can see the, the calderas at the top of the peaks. You can see fault lines. You can see individual flows. So we'll get a, you know, just an unprecedented look at the surface of Venus. Thank you so much. We are also getting questions from online. There's so much interest, uh, and the questions are coming in on social media. So. For everybody watching, remember you can join the conversation by submitting your questions using hashtag AskNASA or commenting in the stream wherever you're watching this. And let's start with a few questions now. Our first question is from at Vanil Sahu on Twitter, who asks, is there any reason behind naming the missions Da Vinci and Veritas? Let's do Da Vinci first and then Veritas. Well. Who doesn't love Leonardo da Vinci, the great Renaissance thinker, innovator, artist, scientist, technologist? He invented helicopters. He painted the Mona Lisa. So what we want to do in taking his name, which is also the acronym for our mission, Deep Atmosphere uh, Exploration of Venus with uh, imaging and measurements of chemistry and noble gases, by taking his great name, cataloged in 500 years of history, and applying it forward to Venus, we want to see the new Venus rising in the view of, of Leonardo. And Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa, one of the most famous paintings of all time. We think there's a Mona Venus waiting, and we want to discover that together for all of humanity. Wouldn't that be beautiful? 
Well, Veritas is also an acronym. It stands for Venus Emissivity Radar Science uh, Interferometry Topography. Oops, Topography Interferometry um, and Spectroscopy. <laughs> but it uh, means truth, and you know it's been so long since we have been to Venus that there are these ideas from about 30 years ago that I like to call myths that are still floating around about Venus. But we've learned so much about the Earth and other planets that um, they are really outdated ideas and we are excited to uh, bring new instruments to Venus and reveal the truth about Venus. That's a very good answer. I like it. Um, at KDasGupta18 on Twitter asks, which side of Venus will the exploration be carried out? The warmer sunlit side or the colder sun hidden side? I'll start with Dr. Smarkar for this one. And if Dr. Garvin, you want to add on, feel free. Uh, so as an orbiter, we see both the uh, sunlit and the uh, dark side of Venus. So we're constantly going uh, around the planet and going from one side to the other, in fact. Uh, one of our instruments likes to uh, primarily image on the cooler night side, our spectrometer, that will allow us to uh, get at the uh, composition of the surface. So that instrument only operates on the night side because the glare off of the clouds uh, is too intense to um, allow us to see the surface uh, on, the, on the day side, but our radar instrument can see the surface all the time. So for the most part, we uh, are operating on both sides. Well, and, and Karen, if I may add, um, for DaVinci Plus, we're going in with our probe, our flying rover, on the day side over a mountainous region known as Alpha Regio, the first radar bright area seen from Earth with radio telescopes like Arecibo. And so we're going to land in this mountainous zone. It's twice the size of Texas. That's pretty big. And we're going to come in there and see the atmosphere on the sunlit side so we have lots of illumination. You might think it's dark on the day side of Venus, but it's not. And as our probe comes through the clouds, roughly at maybe 90,000 feet, we'll start to see that surface. And it will get sharper and sharper. We'll measure its composition. We'll see it in 3D using new machine vision methods. And eventually, we'll see human scale features as if we're coming in on a helicopter or in your backyard drone. So we're going to use the day side. But as we get there, we're going to visit Venus twice on flybys, taking movies of the upper cloud dynamics using ultraviolet cameras so we can track cloud motions to look at the climatology. So while we go in on the day side, we will also see some of the big Venus that Sue's mission will see. Great, thank you. Our next question is also a Da Vinci question. It is from Sohaib24188610, who is from Twitter, and asks, can the Da Vinci Plus probe capture images of the surrounding landscape after it lands on the surface? So the Da Vinci Plus mission does not require landing. We call ourselves a lander to lander because we make measurements all the way through the atmosphere as if we're landing ourselves and then we don't have to land because we'll get all of our data as you can see, the probe being released from our mother spacecraft developed by Lockheed Martin. We'll get all those data back through our mother ship back to Earth. But if we survive landing, we have the capacity to operate for a few tens of minutes. But we think our final images and final chemical measurements made maybe 100 meters above the surface, and here we're in the clouds flying through that area about 100,000 feet high, will show us features as small as baseballs, hockey pucks on the surface. So we could see that Venus almost as if we've landed. And the probe has instruments that can measure the chemistry, temperature, pressure, composition, all the way down, literally as a kind of a drive-by chemi chemistry lab. So we don't have to land to do our mission. It would be great if we did, but we're going to Venus. All right. Uh, next one, I will uh, also start with Dr. Smarkar, but you may well want to join in, Dr. Garvin. This is from at MedClicks on Twitter, who's asking, what really inspired NASA to return back to Venus? Uh, it is really exciting. At the same time, it's very challenging to accomplish this hottest planet destination. What are your thoughts? Why do you think we're inspired to go back to Venus? Um, well, so many reasons, but um, you know, I, we heard from the interview with uh, um, Senator Nelson and Dr. Zabukin about the different atmospheres and the different uh, surface temperatures for Venus and Mars. And so, you know, Earth is kind of like the, the Goldilocks planet. It's just right, you know, and uh, Mars is uh, cold and barren today. Uh, Venus is super hot and Earth is just right. So, um, you know, we've learned so much in the past decades about, about Mars 
Um, and of course, we're learning new things about the Earth all the time. So we really need new data for Venus to be able to understand what it is that makes Earth unique. Why is it the only place we know of yet that has life? Why is it uh, so so supremely habitable today? We, we need data from Venus to be able to answer this mystery and look for uh, similarly habitable planets around other stars. Well, if I may add, Karen, I would say agree 100 million percent with Sue, but it's because it's time, folks. If we ignore our sister next door, what do you think that says? I mean, I guess we ignore our neighbors sometimes, but in this case, we don't want to. But she has so much to tell us. And yes, she's hard, but the engineers of planet Earth, those women and men that make things possible, that we just talk about all the time, they're going to let us do Venus right. So we can use what she's trying to tell us. She's been trying, literally wailing at us over the last 30, 40 years to come home, to come back. And there's there's Venus, as you can see from Magellan, a beautiful view. We need to go back because the time is right. We have the tools, we have the people, we have the models, we have the interest. And wouldn't it be horrible if we didn't know our sister next door and started to see this plethora of extra exo Venuses that Dr. Shabukin was talking about? There may be dozens of them that we see with our James Webb telescope. We have to measure our Venus to understand those Venuses. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Um, the next question is from William on Facebook, who asks, what materials will be used to keep the spacecraft from melting? That's probably a Da Vinci uh, question for starters, but Veritas may well have its own uh, thermal uh, constraints to work with. Well, Venus is hot and hard, as, as good question, but we're building our spacecraft is about a meter diameter, spherical or hemispherical titanium pressure vessel. It's like the bathscapes that carry great Ocean, uh, ocean Explorers. You can see the Da Vinci probe there. It's about three and a half feet across. It has spin vanes, so we can take beautiful images all the way down. Um, it's made of titanium, and inside we use a phase change material to keep the temperature just right for those exquisite instruments that measure the chemistry. And we have other techniques, a special kind of seals that allow just the atmosphere in when we attempt to make those ingests of atmosphere, and at other times don't let it in. So this technology, it's worked before for our colleagues in Russia. Um, we used it in the late 70s. We're advancing it to the 21st century to open that Venus frontier so we can go there and be there. Yeah, and we have a much uh, easier job in, in the atmosphere uh, than uh, Da Vinci has going to the surface. But uh, there is still a lot of heat that reflects off the clouds, especially on the day side. So we do have uh, extra material on our solar panels that allow us to reflect some of that heat and uh, make sure there's not too much of a temperature gradient from one side of the spacecraft to another. Great, thank you so much. We're still going. Remember, you can send in your questions to at Ask NASA. Um, sorry, that's hashtag Ask NASA. Um, next up, we have a question from at Nick BE24 on Twitter, who asks, what data are you hoping to collect through these missions? We can do Dr. Smarkar again first and then Dr. Garvin. We are uh, excited to be collecting a number of different data sets, global topography, global radar images. Uh, we will uh, get data from our spectrometer about the surface composition. We look for, um, we use that data to look for recent volcanism. We can get a thermal signature of active volcanism. Uh, we will be looking for gases coming from volcanoes and water in particular given off by uh, active volcanoes. So, um, and, and the lastly, we take uh, gravity data, which tells us about the core, uh, about the mantle. And I just wanna say we're also taking data to uh, measure active deformation on the surface. So we have a bunch of different um, ways to see the surface. Well, on DaVinci Plus, our job is to make hundreds of exquisite chemical measurements. Again, as I said, an order of magnitude better than ever made before, and hundreds of times. We will make a complete transect of the atmospheric chemistry. We will sniff the inert noble gases and look at their isotopic ratios. That's a big word. Sounds like it's out of jeopardy, but it's not. It's something that allows us to piece together the past history of Venus. Why was atmosphere changed and, and oceans lost and volcanoes erupting? We can read all that through the measurements we make in the atmosphere from our chemistry measurements. We'll also take hundreds of descent images through our surface port right at the bottom, sapphire window, will let us see the surface bright and sharp, just like the landings on Mars, only we'll do them in 3D with composition. 
So we'll be able to measure what the rocks are like locally to compare the SUS measurements to the global ones from Veritas. And in the, in, the mount, in the mountains of Alpha, we're thinking these could be an ancient continent with evolved rocks like you find in the mountains of New England or the Canadian Shield. So we'll make those measurements and pressure, temperature, accelerations, all the way down. It'll be a wild ride. And that data will be a boundary condition for scientists for generations to come. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a lot more questions coming in from, from social media and online, but all of you sending your questions are not the only ones excited about these new solar system missions. So we're going to hear from some other Veritas and Da Vinci Plus mission team members. NASA is returning to Venus after 30 years. We are going back to Venus and our team of managers, engineers, scientists, technicians, and instrument developers are ready. I was extremely excited to get to compete with other professionals to try and put a new mission around Venus. Hi everybody and good morning. I'm in an environment right now that is as different from Venus as you can possibly be. We have water, we've got ice, we have trees. Venus is one of the most enigmatic worlds that we know of. We have so many unanswered questions about the planet next door. How did Venus form? Did it have oceans? Where did the water go? How Earth and Venus tended, became so different. What makes a rocky planet become habitable and what makes it not? What ancient climate may be preserved in the rock record? You know, these are the compelling questions that drive me to study Venus. I am passionate about Venus because it's been a puzzle that has confounded us for so many decades. Venus promises those answers. We're going deep into the atmosphere, learning about the atmosphere. We're going into orbit to get some long-term images, and this should be a fantastic mission. I also, as a geologist, I'm anxious to see the surface of Venus with my own eyes, as it were. I imagine what it is to be in the cloud of Venus, to travel through the transparent hot atmosphere below, and especially the environment near the surface where the air is so thick that in some way we are between a, a gas and a liquid. In my wildest dreams, we're going to find a Venus that is even more volcanically active than what we observe on Earth today. The secrets of Venus past habitability will allow us to understand the evolution of Earth-sized planets around other stars. I am very inspired and very happy to continue in the business of exploration but also the business of inspiration. We're looking forward to bringing the scientific community and the public along with us on our adventure. This is a really exciting mission and I am so proud to be part of it. I can't wait for the data from Da Vinci. Working with a beautiful spacecraft with clever mission design and state-of-the-art instruments and getting to making that happen it would be tremendous fun and looking forward to it. Go Veritas. And go Da Vinci Plus. It is so great to see all the excitement and enthusiasm around these new missions. Um, speaking of excitement and enthusiasm, let's go back to the questions uh, from all of you at home, sending them in. Uh, we have Kanal A on YouTube who asks, will there be new technology on the missions to Venus that hasn't actually been invented yet? I'll toss to either of you. Well, I can just say, the technology of, of encapsulating the next generation kind of instruments we're flying to Venus, the kind that are operating on Mars now in conditions that are a lot more clement, um, had to be invented for us to even have a chance of flying these missions. These are competitively selected missions by, by Dr. Zervokin and, and the colleagues at NASA. So we have to compete for the right and the chance to do that. And so the technologies we invent are invented now to go to Venus. And we hope we can test new technologies as part of our technology demonstration experiments to even extend that further. And we have one on DaVinci Plus to measure the hyperspectral composition of the upper clouds of Venus to see what are the mystery absorbers like. This is the kind of future casting we want to do at NASA that's just emblematic of who we are. Yeah, I mean, we uh, have another technology demonstration on Veritas. It's called a Deep Space Atomic Clock, and it is incredibly accurate. And uh, by bringing that uh, new technology development along, uh, we can help improve our ability to um, measure the motion of our spacecraft and use that to sense the interior of the planet, to, incense, to sense the gravity field. 
uh, and it'll help future missions uh, as well to be able to provide uh, even better data for the interior of uh, perhaps icy saddle, icy moons or uh, other bodies where they uh, can fly the deep space atomic clock in the future. Um, and, you know, uh, Veritas has a lot of excess launch mass, so it's entirely possible that um, NASA will decide to add another payload on that's, uh, you know, being developed as we speak and maybe selected in a future competition. So stay tuned. We'll see what we actually launch with. Great. Uh, Zero Shuki on YouTube asks, how are you going to keep the spacecraft up and running as long as possible since most die so fast? I'm going to tweak this slightly um, to add just about how long each mission is expected to, to the lifetime of each mission. But I think it's a starter question for Da Vinci with going down onto the surface. Well, our mission is, is a little over two and a half years. We actually launch and fly by Venus twice to collect special atmospheric remote sensing data. We're all about the atmosphere. We think that's the history book of Venus that we want to read. And so we'll make these maps of cloud motions. We'll look at the atmosphere as we look at that of Earth. You can see the Earth here as we launch to Venus. Um, so we're very excited about that. But then our final mission, we release our probe. And you can see us being released on our trans-Venus injection um, after we launch. Um, but it'll take us about six months to get to Venus. We'll fly by Venus twice. And then uh, going around the sun, we'll come back and we'll release our probe two days out. And then our probe spacecraft, again, in an aeroshell, will fly through the atmosphere for about an hour and reach the surface, landing at about a speed of maybe 20, 25 miles an hour. And during that time, we'll collect thousands of data sets of a new type, chemistry, imaging, composition, uh, pressure, temperature, see the lower surface of Venus for the first time in this new way. And so the overall uh, probe mission will be about an hour. We survive in the surface. We may have another couple of tens of minutes. And then our spacecraft will play all that data back. So that's our mission lifetime. And uh, for Veritas, uh, we get to Venus very rapidly uh, in about six months. And then we spend uh, quite a bit of time going from a, a big orbit uh, that goes out, you know, 10,000 kilometers, uh, and then bringing that orbit down slowly to being uh, just a few hundred miles above the surface. So uh, we actually use our solar panels uh, to effectively act like uh, drag flaps. Um, you know, uh, you have a spoiler on the back of, a, of a, uh, a, a racing car. Well, we use our solar panels instead, and we dip uh, gently into the atmosphere, and it slows us down uh, over, the, over the course of about a year. And in that time, we get into the precise orbit we need to be in to uh, get the best performance out of our instruments. So, uh, you know, after about uh, two years, we're ready to start taking our science data, and we spend about uh, three and a half years acquiring science data, uh, mapping uh, in a series of uh, global passes around the planet. Thank you so much. Uh, the next one up is a Da Vinci question. Uh, John Spellman on YouTube asks, will Da Vinci Plus be able to detect phosphine molecules? What would it mean for future missions if phosphine was actually discovered by Da Vinci? So first, Da Vinci has two analytical chemistry experiments. One can detect phosphine throughout the entire atmosphere, especially from the lower clouds all the way to the surface, where none of no species with phosphorus have been detected. So we will be looking for that with exquisite detail, like the measurements being made on Mars now with our, our instrument. We also have an instrument that's a very special one that uses lasers and scattering that can measure lots of great species. And we can adapt that instrument by adding a new channel, which is an option that we'll be pursuing in the next couple of years, to specifically measure the phosphine. That's such an exciting possibility for Venus. The bigger point, though, is we will measure the chemical context of all those interesting trace gases. Phosphine, which smells like swamp gas, but other ones that might be equally interesting that we haven't even discovered yet. And by producing that context, we can start to think about Venus as an astrobiological target. So it's not just phosphine. It's all of the context of the chemistry of this rich atmosphere that could have had a habitable, habitable cloud deck at one point in its past or not. But we need the context to understand that possibility. That's how the astrobiology community has recommended we work, and that's what we're going to do with Da Vinci Plus. Thank you. Next one is a volcanology question, so I'm going to toss this one to Dr. Smrekar. Um, Srivatsa M on YouTube asks a speculative question about Earth. If all the volcanoes on Earth started erupting at once, could that turn Earth to look into something like Venus in just a couple of decades? 
Uh, it would take a, uh, a lot more. Than <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, I, I uh, will have to uh, draw on some uh, conclusions that I'll, that I'll um, uh, put together as we speak. But there are about a couple dozen active volcanoes on Venus, and there are many uh, on Earth. Pardon me. And uh, there are uh, many more that haven't erupted recently. So uh, if we take all of those and put them together we would certainly have a very big impact on our climate uh, and we would feel that you know right away but uh, it would not turn us into a venus that would take uh, you know probably uh, hundreds of millions of years before you would get to such an extreme point as um, as venus is and you know really the a major difference between the climate of earth and venus is that on earth because we still have our oceans um, the co2 the carbon dioxide is locked up in our rocks, in our carbonate rocks. They, that carbonate uh, gas dissolves in the ocean and it precipitated out. It just sank to the bottom and created these carbonate rocks. And so, uh, you know, unless we release all that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, uh, we'll never become like Venus. Good to know. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> for, for, for that fate, we, you know, we have other things to worry about, but uh, we won't get all the way to being a, a planet like Venus. All right, next question. Lou on Facebook asks, is it true that Venus's atmosphere smells like rotten eggs? Who wants to take that one? Well, I can give a stab and Sue can obviously finish. Um, so rotten eggs, of course, is an acquired smell based on gases, uh, uh, compounds that involve hydrogen and sulfur. We'll be able to measure those. But however, the most of the atmosphere of Venus is made of carbon dioxide with nitrogen and argon and other inert gases. So a portion of the atmosphere in the clouds you just saw is where we expect to find those special um, sulfur and hydrogen compounds. Um, and that constitutes this really thick cloud deck that is very difficult to see through, needing instruments like Sue has. But we'll be sniffing those with instruments, not human noses, to measure what they're made of and tell you specifically, would they smell like rotten eggs or swamp gas or other things that would be very exciting to smell? And I think we'll connect the smells of humanity to the measurements of Venus if, when we fly our DaVinci Plus Pro. Well, I will leave it at that. Uh, the next question is Caden Colbath on YouTube, who asks, how long does it take to get to Venus? Dr. Smekar mentioned that. Why don't we go to you for this one? Sure. Um, well, it depends on um, how close you are to Venus uh, when you launch. but uh, we have different possible trajectories that would get us there from anywhere as short as, uh, you know, four months to as long as nine months. But we're hoping for a sweet spot, sweet spot around six months to get there. All right, I'm going to add on a, a slight addition to that question from at Future Starman on Twitter, who is also asking how long until the missions are ready to launch. Well, um, we could be as ready as early as 26. Um, NASA has asked us to be ready to launch in uh, 28. Uh, that works best for their phasing of all of their various missions. So that's our goal at the moment. Right, NASA has dictated launch uh, scenarios for us based on funding profiles, which we're grateful, grateful to have. And so our missions are, are scheduled for the 28 to 2030 timeframe to reach Venus. And so that's going to be a great time to go to Venus. James Webb will be flying. We'll be seeing exo-Venuses. Maybe they'll look like the Venus we see here from Magellan. So we can't wait. Sooner would be better, but we'll take anything. All right. Tell us a little bit more about Venus. We're getting some good questions about the planet itself. Sonia on Facebook asks, does Venus have gravity? Uh, well, I can take that one. Uh, we're going to measure the gravity field of Venus um, very precisely. And uh, absolutely, it has gravity. It's, um, sorry, I keep <laughs> going the wrong direction here. But um, <laughs> I need gravity to hold me in place. Um, yeah, so we, <laughs> we are going to measure the gravity. It is just slightly less than that of the Earth because it is slightly smaller planet. Um, so uh, the gravity at the surface is about 10% less than on Earth. 
All right, this one will be for you as well, Dr. Smrekar. Robert on Facebook asks, is there evidence that oceans existed or are they theoretical? Actually, I take it back. I think either of you can answer that and Da Vinci is looking for oceans. So I, I may toss this one to Dr. Garvin. I got that backwards. Well, uh, Karen, I can take a stab and I think Sue should as well. So the, the evidence of oceans is recorded in the measurements that were made from spacecraft in the late 70s that involved measuring the what are called the isotopes of hydrogen. And that critical ratio of regular hydrogen and heavy hydrogen gives us an insight on how much water bound um, in, in hydrogen molecules was present. And we made that measurement thanks to Pioneer Venus Large Probe. And since, since then, atmospheric, high atmospheric measurements have been made by the Venus Express mission. And they show a possibility of very grand oceans. But the real exciting thing is, like you can see here, um, perhaps for billions of years through Venus history. The exciting thing is that new atmosphere climate models developed by the community around the world have shown us the possibility that if Venus works the way we think, and again, as Sue said, there may be myths about what we think until we measure more, but if it does, Venus could have harbored oceans for three and a half billion years. What Da Vinci Plus will do is measure that ratio at exquisite, exquisite precision, 10 times through the atmosphere from above the clouds all the way to the near surface. And that will set the record straight. Did it have big oceans? Did it? When were they lost? How were they lost? Why were they lost? Those are key questions we can ask um, through the chemical measurements that we will make in context with Da Vinci Plus. Right, and uh, Veritas will take another slice at that question. We are looking for evidence of um, analogs of Earth's continents. Uh, on Earth, the continents that we live on formed when huge amounts of oceanic crust, the basaltic crust, iron-rich crust, melted in the presence of water. And so with our instruments, we're going to determine if these giant plateaus on Venus are in fact uh, just like Earth's continents and are thus telling us about the history of past water, that uh, that crust melted in the presence of water and uh, you know shows us that uh, there's still this history of water locked in the rock record at the surface. All right, thank you. Next question is from Sriyanosh Singh on YouTube, who asked another speculative question that we cannot specifically answer for NASA, but it says, will far future Venus missions include a sample return system from Venus? And of course, we cannot predict what NASA will choose down the road, but if you know of anybody thinking about it or what samples might uh, tell us, I'd love to hear. Well, and yeah, we don't even think about it now, we can move on. <laughs> I was just going to say, Sue did a great study for a Venus sample return mission, so I think she could actually uh, tell us how we might do that. Well, uh, there are a number of sample return mission studies uh, in work, and so uh, it's super challenging. You know, we're, we're looking at trying to do that for Mars right now, and um, the, perhaps the, the biggest challenge is getting that surface, uh, that sample, that, that sample to um, Back to the Earth is getting it off of the surface of Venus. So there are a lot of studies underway to uh, begin to address that question. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot in the coming decades from uh, the process of returning samples from Mars. So it's, it's in the pipeline in terms of developing the approach. All right, that's exciting. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Taylor on YouTube asks, how do you think the planetary science gleaned from these missions could benefit human habitation on the moon, Mars, and beyond? I'll go to Dr. Garvin first, and Dr. Smrekar, please join in if you have other thoughts. Well, as we explore, we learn how to extend the limits of our performance. So at Venus, we have challenges as we go into the atmosphere, and those technologies can produce new thermal regulation systems, like the heat shields that got the Apollo astronauts back from the moon, developed that were then used by the Viking Project to get into the atmosphere of Mars to land to exquisite landers. That feed forward is, is typical of our missions, and we want to get the women and robots and, and next generation to the moon and, of course, to Mars. So what we do in all of our planetary exploration is build the piece parts. And we build them together in a mosaic of future capabilities that we can then use. And some of them extend to IT solutions. So we need to be able to process data, especially seeing things in new ways with camera systems and, and systems that measure chemistry. The environmental health of people will depend on some of the kind of instruments that we'll be flying into the atmosphere of Venus, for example. And we need that to keep the crews alive as they live on the moon and do their work through the Artemis program in the Artemis Base Camp. 
So there's always a feed forward, and we at NASA, I think, do a good job about capitalizing on that. So that's my one cent. I'm sure Sue will have better ones. <laughs> no, I think you said it well. Uh, really, every technology that we develop and every uh, mission that we build and send out into outer space uh, you know, helps us uh, learn lessons of uh, taking the next steps. So I think I have nothing uh, further to add. <laughs> Great. Well, we're talking about the moon and Mars. Let's bring it back down to Earth. At Planthony C on Twitter asks, what sort of context will these two new missions provide for climate data collected by the upcoming NASA Earth System Observatory missions? We can tweak that to at least how does it help us understand climate if you don't know about the ESO mission specifically? Well, I can take a quick stab. So the ESO missions, starting with NISAR and other missions like Clario and PACE and, and on out, um, build on the climate history of our own planet, where we have an exquisite capability of modeling and predicting, and it's just, it's taking off, it's so exciting. And we apply that to worlds like Venus and try to backcast. And so by making the kind of measurements that both Da Vinci Plus and Eratos will be making at Venus, we build the boundary conditions to cast those models for Venus. Today, those models are limited. We don't have adequate data. We don't even know the temperature lapse rate from below the clouds to the surface well enough to constrain some models. Well, how does it change? Well, we need that for Earth, of course, and we need the history of water. We need all these features. We need the topography of Venus as a primary boundary condition. We need to know why its very slow rotation will affect those kind of climate models. So we will learn from these missions and apply them, the, the lessons we learned from Venus, apply them to Earth the same way we learned from Mars and its very interesting topsy-turvy climate history has also shed light on the history of climate on Earth. So there are always these connections as we go somewhere and apply it back home, in my view. Yeah, you know, there, you are, there are so much. many... Yeah, if I could just add, I mean, there's so many parallels between Venus and Earth. Um, you know, the people who discovered the ozone hole uh, on the Earth that has a you know, major effect on Earth's climate were actually people who were studying uh, the chemistry of Venus's atmosphere, and they decided to go and look for ozone. And as a process, and, and in that process, discovered this ozone hole. And similarly, people who have uh, proposed using sulfur to try to help uh, slow down uh, climate change on the Earth, uh, you know, people studying the, the climate on Venus said, you know, look, that that's really not going to work because we see on Venus the breakdown of sulfur at the top of the atmosphere. So, you know, there are parallels to the present day climate, but there are also pr parallels to the long term climate. I mean, you know, we think that Venus and Earth have similar amounts of carbon dioxide uh, altogether, but on Venus, uh, that carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, making it this incredible, you know, runaway greenhouse that makes it uh, 900 degrees at the, at the surface. Whereas on Earth, those, that same carbon dioxide is locked up in the rock record. And by studying like processes of uh, subduction, where where the crust goes from the surface back into the mantle, that, that's effectively sequestering uh, carbon dioxide, right? And so we're going to learn how that process may have started on the Earth. So you know uh, we could talk for a long time, but there are just so many parallels between Venus and Earth, and uh, it's all essential to really understanding both the present day and long term evolution of the climate. All right, we are finishing up here with some of our last questions. Uh, at David Johnson BG on Twitter asks, when did you first find your own interest in solar system exploration? Let's do Dr. Smirkoff first and then Dr. Garvin. Uh, well, uh, you know, I was certainly a kid when uh, Apollo astronauts were landing on the moon. And of course that was uh, very mind blowing and inspiring. Um, but I think I did not completely uh, imagine planetary uh, geology, geophysics as a career until I got to college. And it was really there that I learned I could study how processes work in other planets. And I was completely hooked. It was uh, just a fascinating idea of being able to do that. And so um, that led me to uh, doing things like studying uh, volcanoes on Hawaii as a means to learn about uh, volcanoes on Earth. <laughs> Well, Karen, I, I like Sue, I, I, my mother said I was hooked at birth, 
but I, I don't know what that means, so we can all reflect on that. Um, and so, but I was looking up at the moon as a little kid and saying, why aren't we there? And my parents said, well, it's a long trip and, you know, gas prices, not going to work. But um, like Sue, I was enthralled by Apollo and saw the Apollo 11 landings as a young kid and couldn't believe it. I was able to then transfer that through my college experience and high school to visit places that reminded me of these. Here, the impact site, Shamanshin in in Kazakhstan, the most recent big impact. And searching for Venus on Earth has always been one of my passions. Uh, two of my advisors in college and in grad school told me, you better look at Venus, Jim, even though I was funded by Mars. So I basically reconstructed my whole graduate school career to study Venus and was able to participate in the Soviet missions to Venus, like the Venera 13 lander here that lasted 127 minutes. This is its sister sitting in Moscow. Here we are thinking about Venus 15 years ago when we started the the sojourn to become uh, a mission like Da Vinci Plus. We are very excited about actually making it work. And here, the Eye of Venus with me, um, looking through the sapphire window that we we now look forward to flying to Venus. So I was always dazzled, and I don't think I can ever let go. I can't actually stop working on it. So my uh, family often tell me that. So it's uh, science doesn't sleep. I can attest to that. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is all the time we have for today. And I really want to thank you both for joining us. And well, thank you pleasure. so much thank for having much. us. And uh, if you want more information on Veritas or Da Vinci, you can visit go.nasa.gov slash new Venus missions. And you can also follow us on at NASA Solar System on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, I'm Karen Fox.